Broadcasting the information the mainstream media won't touch. This is The Richie Allen Show in association with DavidIke.com. I mentioned in the introduction that my uh, first guest has had a pretty tough time of it of late. Uh, I said that she spent over five years telling the police that the Lost Prophet singer Ian Watkins was sexually abusing children. She wasn't believed. In fact, she was labelled a nuisance by both the police and social services. They even charged her with being in possession of uh, child porn images. Now, she'd actually got him to send her those images so that she could prove what he was up to all along. Uh, she went to court and she was quite rightly acquitted. So what was going on, as I asked you earlier on? Why did the police take so long to act? Why and who were they uh, protecting? Let's welcome to the programme, uh, terrific, I think she's incredibly courageous, uh, Joanne Majelix. Joanne, it's lovely to have you on the programme. Welcome, how are you? I'm fine, thanks, Rich. And I'm calling you Rich, sorry, Richie. You can call um, me Rich. David calls me Rich. My mother calls me um, Richard, but you're in an exclusive club there. It's David <laughs> saying Rich. I've become Rich. You can call me whatever you want. You've had some year of it, haven't you? Yes. Um, and it, it's been basically my, my own personal hell. And the police made it worse because I, in a way, they forced me to keep going back to him even though I didn't want anything to do with him. I walked away from him for about 18 months after I first reported him. And uh, everything that I did, everything that I took, showed the police, um, everything was never enough. For now, them to do can, I, can I just say to you, your microphone is really good on your computer or laptop and you're kind of, I think you're really close to it, Joanne. So we're getting a lot of, um, we're getting a lot of popping. Do you want to just kind of sit back just a little bit from it? And I can tweak a few buttons here and I can make you I'm sound like... Sky- phone and I've got you on speaker. Oh, have Hang you? Because you might be very close. It, it happens sometimes when you kind of lean close to it. Um, you, you get a bit of popping. But don't worry, we, we'll sort that out anyway. Um, do you want to go back then? I mean, look, listeners are going to... We, we don't want to dwell on what yeah. um, Ian Watkins did. We certainly do not at all. I uh, we want to yeah. talk about the police and everything else. But give our listeners, especially our listeners in the United States and in the Far East, who may have briefly heard about the story but don't know it all give them the kind of synopsis of it Joanne take them back to when when you knew Ian and when you knew something was wrong and what you were doing about that okay um when I first met him um nine years ago now and in 2006 and at first everything was great you know he's the most charming guy in the world and you know sweet off your feet makes you feel like you're the only one in the world and about a year into it, he starts saying very strange things about um, the underage fans that he'd had sex with. And I told him to shut up talking because it just upset me. I said, shut up, shut up talking. And he'd laugh and say he was only joking. But it progressively got younger and younger. And he kept saying that he wanted to have sex with 11-year-olds then. And he made very inappropriate comments about a four-year-old girl. But um, I'm not going to say who it was. I don't want to identify the child at all. We we can guess, yeah. But um, it was a four-year-old girl that was in a lot of, had a lot of contact with him, let's just say. Um, And he sent images of that child in possession of cocaine. And he said the pictures were a joke. But he also said to me, um, when he took those images, he had rubbed the cocaine on her gums and touched her inappropriately, I'm just going to say, inappropriately. Um, I gave those images to the police and to child services in his hometown of Pontypridd, South Wales. Um, The police basically took three months to even come and take my statement. So in that three months, they had been in constant contact with his solicitor and his solicitor had um, fed them a lot of lies about me. They said, he said that um, I had a restraining order against me by the Watkins family. That was entirely untrue. Um, Apparently, because I have now possession of police documentation, And there's police documentation and police logs that say that I've had a restraining order against me and I've been sectioned. Now, if you're sectioned, you are forcibly put into a mental institution or mental hospital against your will. 
And there'd be a record of it. Never. Yeah. Never happened. Never, yeah, and there would be a record of it. There would be a record of a restraining order. There would be a record of me being sectioned. The police never, ever, even, they didn't even bother checking if that was true or not. So for all these years, every time I made a report to police or made a complaint to police about him, all these times they were just referring back to those original lies about me and thinking, well, she's a bloody nut job. This is amazing, Joanne. <laughs> this is amazing. Now, let's just clarify what you've said already. We, we know this to be true now, of course. Thank God we know this to be true. He, you saw a photograph that he had of a young girl with cocaine. And yeah. um, the, remind us that the photograph also suggested that there was inappropriate conduct, uh, contact between him and the child. You bring that photograph to the police, which is a wonderful thing to do. It's what you should do. And they take months before coming back to you. And in the meantime, they're liaising with his brief or solicitor and they're not really doing much about it at all. And what he did as well, because he t- um, I broke contact with him then for about 18 months. Just, uh, yeah, about 18 months I broke contact with him. Because um, I didn't want to, I walked away. I didn't Google him or anything. I didn't want to know what he was doing. Um, because um, it took three months for them to even come and speak. Because I was living in um, West Yorkshire at the time. And obviously I was reporting it to his local police force down in South Wales. So they said, oh, we don't know whether we're going to go up there and interview you or whether we're going to get a West Yorkshire officer to come and interview you. But in that three months, he told me 18 months later that what he had done is hid all his laptops, everything at a friend's house. So even if the police had come to his, his address at that time, there would be nothing. They wouldn't have found anything. Let's give our listeners a kind of an idea of the timeline. So it's at, um, it's in late December in 2008 when Joanne went to Pontypridd Child Services and said that um, Watkins was um, having very inappropriate conduct with a child. A couple of days later, um, Joanne wrote a letter to the uh, Child Services in Rhonda, I believe, the the Rhonda Valley. And... um, there was a meeting then at some stage in early 2009, probably sometime in January, and you were then interviewed a couple of months later in March by West Yorkshire Police. As you've just said, we want to get this yeah. straight for our listeners now. And yeah. you told them what was going on. And, and this is what you just cannot believe. Thank God, you know, I mean, it must have been terrible for you going through the trial and you might want to talk about that in a couple of minutes time. But I almost yeah. say thank God you did do because people wouldn't know about this if you hadn't done. Wait mm-hmm. for this, dear listener. In June then, They closed the bloody investigation. They just closed it. Despite the evidence that you'd given them, despite those pictures, they closed. And did they tell you at that stage, did anybody ring you up and say, out of courtesy, uh, hey, Joanne, listen, just to tell you, we've looked into what you said, but we can't. I had to call them. I had to call them and that's how I found out. Oh, yeah. I called them to say, what the bloody hell's going on? Um, And now, because I was put on trial, and the CPS, the Crown Prosecution Service, have a duty to disclose anything um, to the defendant. So I, I my, well, my solicitor now, is in possession of a lot, uh, hundreds of pages of documents, basically. And one of them is dated the same day or around the same day that I report him in December 2008. And there's a handwritten note And it's by this detective sergeant who had decided to close the investigation. And he says, although the pictures are alarming, we're reluctant to investigate because it would be high profile and create a lot of press interest. That's just... What? (laughs) uh, Yeah. I mean, look, I I have family who work in, um, not in social services, but I have uh, family at home in Ireland. Uh, Two aunts of mine actually have worked with children who come from difficult backgrounds and who who have been abused in the home. And um, two great ladies, my aunts, they've been doing it for years. And um, I know they'll be listening to this, either now or on the podcast. And for them to hear that, is that a police officer could see uh, an explicit image of a child that a rock star had possession of. an explicit image. Let let me just stop you there, Richie. The images that he sent me of that little girl, um, they weren't, she was fully clothed. There was nothing. uh, It's just the fact that she had cocaine. The cocaine. And the context of what he sent to me, say, uh, in an email saying what had happened when he took those images. That's right. Uh, But you you had the email as well, didn't you? I mean, you had the email as well as the, as well as the picture. Yeah. 
which is absolutely you, you're right. I must I must be careful. I must be absolutely spot on about what I'm saying. When I say explicit, it was of um, a, a child with 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 cocaine. I mean, it's it's yeah. it's it's staggering, really. It's staggering. But when they close, they it, said, "Well, that could be anything. It could be talcum powder or anything." That was their excuse as well. Another excuse: it could be talcum powder. It could be anything. <laughs> what did they say about the email that he sent to you, where he was saying what was going on? Um, nothing because um, I kept. I kept having to call them and each time they kept fobbing me off. And then eventually when I called them and he said there's not enough evidence and the last thing I said to that detective sergeant when I made that phone call and said, what the bloody hell's going on? He said they were dropping it, there's not enough evidence. And I said, I said, I'm not a liar, I'm not a psycho and if anything else happens to another child, it's on your head, not mine. And that were my final words to that detective sergeant in, two, in around April, May 2009. And around about that particular time, I don't know when you found this out now, but around about that time, somebody else contacted the Metropolitan Police to say that Ian Watkins was making very disturbing comments. Did you know about that? Yeah. Um, I didn't know about that until, because obviously, uh, well, you know, the police call me a nuisance. I'm an even bigger nuisance now for them because I've in total made six complaints against the police. And I'll tell you about those in a second. Um, But it wasn't until my first interview with the IPCC about um, the cover-ups involving three police forces covering up and protecting him. It wasn't until that first interview in February 2014 with them that they actually asked me about these other anonymous reports to um, the Metropolitan Police. I think there was Essex Police um, was another one, and, and there was another one, I think. I can't remember which one that was. And they asked me if it was myself that had made those reports and they gave me the dates of those reports and and I said no I said because I've left my name every time I'm not going to call anonymously I said and besides that I was living with someone else in Los Angeles at the time these reports were made in 2010 June to August when these reports were made I was with someone else in Los Angeles at the time it couldn't have been me it couldn't have and, been you yeah it couldn't have been you. and one of the reports was a fella <laughs> It was a bloke. It was a bloke that that he'd made these, <laughs> yeah. these comments. To. Yeah, yeah. And you just refused to go away. And that's the remarkable thing about you. Now, tell us about, was were you still, I mean, you weren't living with, with him, of course, at that stage. But you were oh, still... I, was, I never lived with him. No, no, you never lived never with him. No, no. You, 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 I never called myself his girlfriend. Um, it was, to me, the ideal relationship because, apart from... Yeah, I mean, before all this, it was the ideal relationship because I can't stand someone in my face 24-7. I can't. So it was like a long-distance relationship where we just met up whenever we were in the same country. Um, so I would never call myself his girlfriend or anything like that. Fair enough, yeah, yeah, and, and, and that's important. Now, but you were in contact with him, weren't you? I mean, when you were in Los Angeles, he, he, he stayed in... And, and this is what's... I mean, this is central to... Um, of course, how he eventually came to, uh, you know, to a bad end, thankfully, and he was uh, and he was caught. And some of those conversations, which which, again, you reported and you kept record of. Talk to us about some of those conversations where he was revealing more and more of what he had been doing. Well, it was um, I became uh, I'm going to be open and honest about this, as I have been before. We both got hooked on cocaine. And I stopped doing that in the beginning of 2008 and that's when I really like sobered up and got a clear mind and thought oh my god he said all this stuff you know and he would put it all down to coke talk and he would like make jokes about having sex with underage fans 14 year old fans I'd tell him to shut up talking then he'd start talking about wanting to have sex with 11 year olds and then he made the inappropriate comments about the four-year-old and then the pictures came of the four-year-old and I'm completely so confused by everything that's going off because I'm I'm torn because I've been totally in love with this man. Like, completely. You know, we were in contact every single day. When he was in Los Angeles, I was in the UK. We were constantly talking on instant messenger. It was like we still had the contact there. So I'm torn and I'm thinking, oh, my God, how can I be in love with this man? But be contradicted by thinking oh my god he must be a monster but then he would he would laugh it off and say it was a joke and then I 
stop taking the drugs and I started to tell him in 2008 I started to say look I've got to go to the police about this and I not only told him I was going to the police about it and then he convinced me to go to um where he lived with his mom and his brother he convinced me to go and see his mom he said oh I can't believe this you've been you've been wishing my mum well sending my mum flowers and stuff and asking how she is and now how am I going to tell my mum that the girl that's been sending her flowers is now going to do this to me I said I've got to do it I've got to do it I've got to protect the girl and I went and I met his mom absolutely lovely woman absolutely lovely and he then we go back to the hotel I tell him we're not having sex we don't have sex because I don't I just want to talk to him I want him to look at me in the eye and tell me that it was all bullshit and if he couldn't do that then I was going to the police instead he cried he cried he put his head on my lap cried into a towel and told me about his childhood and it was like we had that bond then because I had a pretty terrible childhood and um, pretty terrible, you know, and he had a similar childhood as well. He was beaten black and blue by his stepdad, um, physically and emotionally abused. I didn't know at that time if there had been any sexual abuse. I didn't know. He didn't say that. Um, but we had a similar childhood. Let me just say that. And so I felt sorry for him. And I and he was telling me about all his burdens, about how he pays all the family's bills. He pays rent on t two properties because his sister was always defaulting on the rent and he had to basically hold her up. And I felt he manipulated me again. I didn't feel manipulated, but he did. That's what he was doing at that time because I was threatening to go to the police. He then goes to his solicitor after I had, because I felt then I've got to warn the mother of the girl. So I sent a text message to the mother because me and her were friends and until now, until that time. When I sent her that text message, somehow he intercepted that text message whether he saw her phone and it flashed up a message from me and he looked at it or she showed him the message, I don't know. But the next thing I know, he has gone to his solicitor uh, about two weeks later and got what he called a gagging order drawn up. And it mentioned this text message that I had sent. And it said that I'd made um, uh, comments and made disparaging remarks or something, something that would damage his re his client's reputation. And I've got to say that it's all false. So I signed it, but I didn't sign it. I wrote all over it. I'll sign this when it isn't full of bullshit. And I sent it back. He called me in tears and said, you've got to do it. You've got to do it. And at the time as well, he owed me £5,000 um, for various things. He owed me £5,000 in total. And I'd, I'd gone to the small claims court, sent him the, the court papers, and he had agreed to pay it. He agreed to pay me. Then we whittled it down to three and a half thousand. He whittled it down um, to three and a half and agreed to pay me two thousand pounds if I signed that. I contacted my own solicitor. I got advice and I said, can I still go to the police if I sign this? And they said, yes, because a criminal investigation overrides any civil agreement. Of course, you can go to the police. So I said, right, OK, I'll sign it. So I signed it. And I got paid two thousand pounds from him that he owed me. Didn't pay anything else, but never mind. Um, and I then I went to the police. First of all, I went to the child services in Pontypridd, and the next day I sent them the images and a letter detail and everything that he'd said. And um, then I spoke to the police. They put me in touch with the police. It's uh, 16 minutes to the top of the hour. If you're just joining the programme, um, I've got Joanne Majelix on the line. Joanne is a former uh, partner of sorts, I suppose, had a relationship with the Lost Prophet singer Ian Watkins. And earlier this year, uh, Joanne um, uh, suffered the ignominy of going to court 
uh, for possession of child sex abuse image offences. She was trying to raise the alarm for a number of years with uh, Child Protective Services and the police in Pontypridd and elsewhere is that uh, Ian Watkins possessed images of children, was abusing children, was a serious threat uh, to children. When you learned, and we're talking a second about, you know, I can't imagine, I said before, the worst thing you can ever be accused of if you're innocent is is uh, having anything to do with harming children. I can't think of anything worse, uh, Joanne. I'd, I'd rather be accused of murder in the wrong is then be accused yeah. of, of interfering with children uh, in the wrong. And, and, and we'll get to that. How, how mad do you get when you find out is that behind, unknown to you, you're being labelled a nuisance? And that's what they called you, a nuisance, for contacting them time and time again with information about what he was doing. How do you, how do you cope with that? How do you live with that, you know? She's a nuisance. Did anybody, has anybody ever apologised to you and said, you know, we're really sorry, no. Joanne. You weren't the nuisance, you know? Nobody. No. Nobody's not so much apologised. No, no, no. And, and it's really strange because I actually recorded a phone call with, um, on the second day of Watkins' trial, the day that I knew that he was going to plead guilty days before he did. And because I was having a conversation with one of the detective sergeants and they had agreed to call me every single day of the trial to let me know how it was going. So um, the Friday before the trial began, I'm having a conversation with this detective sergeant and I'm saying to him, why the hell isn't he pleading guilty? And he said, well, that's what we're thinking. Why isn't he pleading guilty? And I thought he's going to plead guilty. The Monday came, I got a phone call from, from the police and said that, Nothing had really much happened in the trial. And then on the Tuesday, he pleaded guilty. Well, on that Tuesday morning, I had a ph- the, my usual phone call in the morning from the police. And I recorded it this time. And there were two detective sergeants on the phone. The one that was first involved in the investigation, who was absolutely brilliant with me. And then they changed detective sergeants and the tone changed then towards me when they had changed who was in charge. Um, and I'm speaking to them both. And and they said, Joanne, everyone in this office from the from the DI downwards knows it's because of you that we're here today and we can't thank you enough. And I recorded that phone call and I gave it to, when I was arrested and charged. I gave that phone call to my solicitor and I said, we can use this in court. But we didn't need to because the detective sergeant who was on the stand admitted to that, admitted to saying that to me. Yet three months after that phone call, I was arrested for possessing the same images that I kept taking to the police. I took those images to the police five times. That's the sort of thing that... And they arrested that, me three years later. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's one of those... I, how the hell can you even imagine what that's like? When they turn up and they say, we're arresting you under whatever the act is, whatever the bloody law is, for possessing indecent images of children, how did you not pick up everything that you had near to hand and start throwing it, throwing it at them? Well... I mean, when they came to when they came that morning at half seven in the morning, um, I was completely out of it because um, I'm very I'm I'm quite ill. I'm going to say I've been I've been ill for quite some years and it's gotten worse and worse with stress. There's a number of conditions that I have, and on a night time I have to take medication, so I'm completely out of it in the mornings. And um, they came at half seven. I didn't know I didn't even know what day it was. And they came in and they said, we're here to arrest you, Joanne. And I said, what for? And they said, "Um, being in possession of indecent images of children from 2011. I said, what? The images that I took to the police five times? What the hell? And And I was thinking, oh, my God, what the hell are you talking about? And then they left me in the police cell for a few hours because they had to wait until the police from South Wales drove up. And I had a splitting migraine. Um, I didn't get a glass of water until my solicitor came. And I couldn't believe it. And as soon as my solicitor came and, and I was sat with him and we were go, I said, I can't really believe it. Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> and he's saying, calm down, calm down. I said, I won't calm down. And then as I'm interviewed and I got quite upset in the interview because they were trying to force me to remember things that I'd locked out. Now, what happened with me and how I was able to track Watkins because I'd kept calling the police and calling the police had done nothing. 
Telling the police that he'd sent the images had done nothing. Emailing the chief constable had done nothing. So I thought, well, what am I going to do? I've got to switch gears here. Jesus Christ, Joanne, can I just stop you there for a second? People, I want want people to just remember, she had sent images that he had given, uh, Joanne had sent images that he'd given her, not only that, but emails. All the evidence was there that this guy was a predatory paedophile. All of it. And they're turning up at your door saying that you're some sort of sicko that is taking part in uh, the whole fantasy and you're a party to it. Um, your, 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 your solicitor is there. I can't, again, I have to say this, I have to repeat it. I can't imagine for a second what that must feel like to have done nothing wrong and for them to be saying this. And I, I, I imagine, I mean, you were just getting into it there, the questioning. I, I, we've seen it before, and, and I don't mean on television. I mean, we've seen videotapes before of these interviews. Um, they're very bullying, they're very domineering and... Um, you know, as you said, trying to put words in your mouth, trying to trap, uh, you know, trying to trap you. Was your solicitor any mm. good at this stage, Joanne? Was he any good, this guy that you had with you in the room when you were being uh, interviewed about this? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, he was good. It was the same solicitor that I had throughout. Yeah. 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 But um, um, I, I was quite upset because what I, how I dealt with him is because I, I was working, I'd been in the escort business for on and off for some time so I had trained myself and this is what an escort's job is people people think that prostitutes and escorts are just about sex it's not about that it's about being bloody good at pretending to be into someone and making that man feel special and making him feel that you really are into him and you really are his girlfriend so I used that and I could switch myself off as I did when I when I saw my escort clients I became Nikki I was Nikki when I was an escort. I wasn't Joanne. And so I switched myself off because I thought it's been no good crying, running away for months at a time, because while I'm running away for months at a time, he's up to God knows what, and I can't control it. I don't know what he's up to. How can I report what I don't know is happening? So I thought I've got to, I've got to turn this around, play him at his own game and play him, tell him what he wants, tell him what he wants to hear, basically, to, to make him think that I'm on side, but I wasn't. So as soon as he sent those images, I, I contacted the chief constable straight away because I thought, I'm not going to the monkeys, I'm going to the organ grinder this time. So I found the email contact for the chief constable, but it turns out that the email address that I had that was listed on the South Wales Police website was actually the Association of Chief Police Officers, and it went to anyone who had access to that email account. Seven people accessed that email, and I know this because um, it, when it was printed off and, and disclosed to me uh, by the CPS, it had it has on the bottom how many people accessed the email. So seven people accessed that email. The chief constable's secretary then put me back in touch with the same detective sergeant who'd closed the investigation, and he just couldn't be asked to listen to me. He really could not be asked to listen to me. And so I thought, right, I've just got to carry on playing it, playing along with this. I've just got to carry on. And so I switched myself off. So all these all these chats and stuff that I was having with Watkins to trip him up, I'd forgotten them because it's just you go on autopilot. Um, it, it's hard to explain other than like putting yourself on autopilot. It's like I used to also get paid for a sex chat service as well. And that involved text messages as well. I would just switch off and text random stuff to, to escort clients who were paying me 50p per text message. I'd just switch off and do it. And that's how I dealt with Watkins. So all these things that they were trying to force me to remember, I've buried it. It's gone I don't want to remember it. And they were it was like they were continuing to traumatise me. And he was torturing me. Every time I saw him, he kept saying, oh, I can't believe I'm still seeing you after all these times you've tried to put me in jail. Imagine it. And I thought, and, and he just felt invincible. He felt invincible and he knew he was invincible because every single time I went to the police, and it wasn't just five times that I reported him as, as being reported in the press, the fact is I reported him over 10 times, but because the telephone numbers that I was calling were direct numbers to the incident rooms, they weren't logged on the police computer. They didn't even make a note of my phone calls. 
because when you call the 101 number to contact the police or the 999 number, that's automatically logged on the system. But if you call a landline, which is an incident room line, if you call a landline, there's no record of it unless the police the police officer that receives the call chooses to make a note of it. We've had Some a massive amount of tweets. Yeah, we've had a huge amount of tweets on this and emails. Um, they're pretty much all saying the same thing, is that what happened uh, to you and the prosecution is an outrage. Uh, the people who brought the prosecution against you should face justice as well. Now, in a couple of minutes' time, we're going to get into the areas of speculation. And Joanna's got yeah. theories and opinions about why the police behaved the way they did. Uh, a lot of people, of course, and I'm not, I'm not going to put any words in Joanne's mouth, but a lot of people contacting this programme don't believe that the police were lazy and couldn't be arsed. They believe there's something more to it. And in a conversation that Ian Watkins had with Joanne, where he talked about uh, the people he knew and who he knew and what he was doing, um, you know, throws up another whole raft of, of question. But massive amount of people saying... How much bloody money did the state spend on prosecuting somebody who they obviously knew had nothing to do with hurting or taking photographs or keeping photographs of children? I would reckon, Joanne, that the prosecution costs uh, for pros- the 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 the, the, um, the cost of prosecuting you probably ran over a million pounds. I would guess. I don't think it was as much as that. I mean, my barrister, Michael Walkind, who was brilliant, by the way, he he took on my case straight away um, without even his his massive fee because he knew straight away that I had been set up. Um, So I have to say that about him. Um, But he did a very good interview with The Guardian, I think it was. And he said how basically saying how much did they waste? And he said it's, it's in the hundreds of thousands. Definitely. So, yeah, so it could be a half a million quid. It could be a bit more. Could it could be, be a bit less. Could be, yeah. Right. Yeah. It's three minutes to the top of the air. We're not going to take news at the top of the air because there's no need to. They're talking about Paris. They're just repeating the same stuff over and over again about the raid on the house this morning. So we're going to take a wee break. Joanna's going to stay with us. When we come back, we're going to talk about some of the things that Ian Watkins told Joanne. We're going to get into why Joanne believes the the real reasons behind the police's uh, ineffectiveness and their complete buffoonery, uh, to, to, to put it mildly. And we'll also talk about uh, Joanne's take on the new Snoopers Charter, which is very interesting as well. We'll do that in a couple of minutes. Joanne, stay with us. If you want to grab yourself a glass of water there uh, or a cuppa, uh, we'll be right back in about two minutes' time. So Joanne's going to stay with us then. Uh, keep your tweets coming into at Richie Allen Show. It's at Richie Allen Show. Uh, email Richie at richieallen.co.uk. Do you want to release the full potential of your soul consciousness and find out how to experience that power in all areas of your life now? Go to livingasyoursoul.com for free guidance with in-depth how-to articles, free healing meditations of creation recordings, free soul solutions, and much, much more. Livingasyoursoul.com, making the profound practical neonnettle.com a new voice in alternative media for unfiltered news at your fingertips visit neonnettle.com the UK's number one alternative news site in association with the Richie Allen Show neonnettle.com you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. If you're listening to the programme, it's 9pm live on a Wednesday night as the 18th of November 2015. We don't normally do that, but we're not taking as a news. So it's the top of the hour for those of you listening on the repeat cycle. It's the top of the hour now. So you might still make that appointment if you hurry the hell up. We have Joanne Majelix on the programme. She's a former lover, we could say, partner, friend 
of Lost Prophet singer Ian Watkins, who is serving 35 years in prison for child sex offences. Joanne um, couldn't have done any more if she tried to alert the authorities to what he was doing because he was telling her things, he sent her images, he was telling her stuff in emails and she was sharing that with Child Protective Services and with the police. They ignored it. They said she was a nuisance. They said that she was a disgruntled ex-lover, that she was crazy, blah, 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 blah. Of course, she wasn't crazy, as we know by now. Unknown to Joanne, other people were contacting the police to say that they were hearing what can say very disturbing things about children. This guy was obviously a, a grave, a serious and a present uh, threat to children anywhere near him. They turned up on her doorstep one morning and said, we believe that you were involved yourself. And those photographs that you gave us, by the way, uh, to tell us about what Watkins was doing, we believe that you were part of it and uh, um, you were getting off on it and that you were his uh, uh, co-conspirator. Utter nonsense. Uh, It went to uh, court at Cardiff Crown Court. She was acquitted. She was acquitted with prejudice. Um, It was a ludicrous prosecution. Could have cost a half a million quid. Could have cost more. Could have cost less. It was horrendous. Tell me this. Uh, Joanne, how did you feel when, because you never know how these things are going to go, especially when, you know, you must have thought you were in Alice in Wonderland at one stage with all of this. When you were acquitted, how did you feel? Well, at first I just cried because I was so tired. Um, uh, I was so tired. And the thing that I was crying about was the fact that I'd been away. From, I'm going to cry again. I'd Don't been either. away Take from home. Time. I had to fund my own... Um, travel and accommodation in Cardiff because I live up in Doncaster. It's a quite a long way from Cardiff, so I had to pay for a hotel every single night, pay for my train journeys down there, and um, I was completely broke. And I had a son at home, and three cats as well, and they were out of food. I couldn't even send my son money for food, so my sister had to keep like giving them food and everything. And I'm there, and I, and on that final day when they announced not guilty, I was waiting in the courthouse, and I was crying to my solicitor, and I'm saying, Dale, I've got no money. I can't even pay for a hotel tonight, so it can't go on another day. It can't. So I was relieved that it was over because of that, because I, I didn't have to panic about where am I gonna where am I gonna stay tonight? I've I've got thirty quid in my bank, <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, and I just should never have been there. I should never have been there, you know. But I have to look at it that um, at least I got my day in court or my days in court because if they hadn't have charged me, the truth wouldn't have come out and people would have continued to speculate, you know, about me. But at least I proved myself in court. At least I proved the truth and I proved the mistakes in court. That's what I was saying, actually. You, you've put it better than me. That's what I was saying before the break. You know, it was, it was as well that you went to court. It was important that you went to court. Right, we're into, we're into the realms of speculation now. People have been texting and emailing the programme. Uh, not texting, uh, tweeting, I should say, and emailing the programme since it began. And a couple of questions for you. Uh, one question is about Peaches Geldof. Now, a, a number of listeners yeah. have asked me to ask you about her. Um, what yeah. about... What, uh, Alan has just uh, emailed me. Alan says, ask Joanne, does she have any opinion on the death of Peaches Geldof? Peaches named the mothers of two of Watkins' yeah, victims. Then she died um, shortly afterwards. Um, what do you think about Peaches Geldof, uh, Geldof's even part in all of this remind our listeners many of our listeners won't know this why 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 does her name come up why did she name the 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 uh the, the mothers of I've, the uh, two I've, victims i'll tell you what happened and i've explained this on my facebook as well because people have asked me this on facebook yeah. a, a long time ago peaches had nothing to do with it um she, she what what happened because i saw it all unfold on twitter i saw the tweet on twitter and what had happened she was de- out, out she was absolutely outraged at what watkins had done she was outraged and she was posting a series of tweets saying how sickened she was by it and everything and then one of her followers tweeted her the link to the court website because the court serve website mistakenly put the names of the mothers on there 
the, it was the court that messed up. So one of her followers tweeted her the link to that court serve website and said, it's got the names of the mothers on here. There, it's da 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 and da da da. So all Peaches did was retweet that. Which was kind That's of irresponsible, wasn't it? Just Well, just a little bit. It was irresponsible of her because she wasn't thinking at that time that, and because of the fact that the court had put the names on there, people, not just Peaches, but other people were thinking it was fair game. Yeah, it was right. okay to do that because they weren't realising the implications of it. They weren't realising there's a reason why the, the women's name are, are redacted. So it was quite an innocent mistake and the press blew it up all out of proportion. I think. Five minutes past the hour. Let's get down to the brass tacks now. By the way, I'm delighted you came on. And um, I'm going to do a bit of editorialising now, which I probably shouldn't do, but I don't give a damn. Um, <laughs> I think you're great. I can't imagine what it's like. I imagine being accused of um, awful things, you know, to do with children, whether it's actually physically abusing children or passing around images. Imagine, we're speaking to a lady tonight, dear listener, that's gone through that that understands what it's like to be accused of that wrongfully. I was listening to Paul Gambaccini, the great DJ, on Radio 5 Live a few weeks back, and I nearly cried listening to him, and I could cry listening to Joanne. And Paul Gambaccini talked about the nightmare he went through, you know, wrongfully accused of, of, um, of interfering with, um, with, with children. Horrendous. I can't imagine. I really, I keep saying this over and over again. I'd rather somebody said I was an axe murderer than, than they said that about me. I mean, holy Jesus, can you imagine it? And the thing is as well, especially with like Paul as well, because it's so high profile and and the press just, well, they want sensation, don't they? And they just print whatever they bloody like and worry about it later. Or don't even worry about it later, some journalists, do they? No, they certainly don't. We're getting into the kind of nuts and bolts of it now. We're getting into the meat of it. Why? We don't believe, when I say we, uh, I don't, the... People who do the social media for this programme don't. David Icke doesn't believe. We don't believe that the police were incompetent. We don't believe that because of we've looked at cases. Uh, and If it wasn't for David Icke, I wouldn't know much about much of this. But I've been looking at mm-hmm. cases for a number of years. I don't believe it's incompetence. I don't believe it's uh, Inspector Clouseau, uh, Muppetry, stupidity. I believe there's something very dark and sinister behind yes. the way the police behaved. What do you think? Yes. Absolutely. And that is what that's that's why I'm I'm so pleased that I'm I'm on here tonight because for a long time I've been trying to get um this point made. I am sick to death of seeing stories about thirty year old child abuse cover ups. Sick to death of it. Because what the public need to realise and what needs instilling in their minds is that it still continues. If he hadn't have been finally arrested in two thousand and twelve, it would still be continuing today. And and these cover-ups are still continuing. And the fact that he, in one of his final emails that I shared with police, because I gave the police, um, when I was reporting, because I reported both the mothers as well, both the mothers involved in this case, I reported both of them. And the police left their babies with them to continue to be abused. Now, I but hate anyway, to interrupt that- you. I hate to interrupt you. But before we get back to your thoughts about the police, yeah, the mothers of those children, they knew that, um, what was going on was sickening and disgusting. We know that now, do we? Mm. Yeah. Why, Joanne? Have you ever? You're you you're you're a mother. You're a woman. Blokes will never understand what the relationship is between a mother and a child because you carry the child. Jesus, I'm not trying to curry favour with my female listeners, but I mean that. How could they hand the children over to him? How? You know, one of them. One of them, the one, um, the one with the baby boy, she became pregnant on purpose. Oh my God! I fully believe that she became pregnant on purpose because Ian was having, Ian was saying the same things to me. Oh, I'm going to get you pregnant. Let me get you pregnant, and 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 everything. And he wanted to abuse the baby, and I, I, there was no way in hell that I was ever going to get pregnant. Never, ever, and I know that he was saying the same things to other people now. I know this because other women that he had had the same conversations with have come out and admitted it. And one of them also sent me a direct message on Twitter telling me that she had warned another of his girls in Los Angeles, oh, you better speak to the police because the police will come looking for you when they view the video, the sex tapes of him. 
So these women were warning each other to go to the police and speak to the police before they came after them. And I'm thinking, why was I the only one arrested then? And I have seen transcripts of police, actual police interviews with two other women who were in Germany. The police went over to Germany to interview these women. I've seen copies of the, the police interviews, the transcripts that were disclosed to me. And they're being interviewed about arranging to meet Watkins with children to abuse and exchanging God knows how many images or videos of child pornography with him. Why were the only people arrested, the, the three people that I handed to them on a plate and myself? So we're back Whereas to the question I asked you a couple of minutes ago. What's going on? Tell us about that email. Tell us about what you told me today about comments that he made to you about yeah. circles that he was operating in. And in, go on. Yeah. I'd been away for a few months in Australia to go and visit family with my son. And I came back and Ian kept wanting to see me. And I said, OK, well, I'm in London on the 5th of October. I'm seeing friends in London on the 5th of October. I'll see you then. So I saw him on the morning of the Saturday, the 6th of October. And the first thing he said to me, this is how the email came about. The first thing he said to me comes into the room completely off his face on crystal meth and whatever else he'd taken. And he says, I've got a two-year-old to rape on Tuesday. And I said, what? And he said, I've got a two-year-old on Tuesday. And I said, Who's, whose child is it? And he said, oh, you know, it's a super fan. And I'm asking him, what the hell is a super fan? What does that mean? And he said, oh, you know, I've got all these fans that will do anything for me. And at some point during that morning, he was checking his iPad and I glanced over at his iPad and he was checking either an email or something, a Twitter notification, something. And I recognised the picture, uh, the icon of the person that had sent it. And it was the woman from Bedford with the baby girl. And my heart sank. I felt sick in my stomach and I thought, oh, my God, because I did a quick calculation. I knew who she was because she had been she had followed me on Twitter for some time and had befriended me, like pretended to be my friend, pretended to be in support of me going to the police all these times. And I'm thinking, why is she messaging him? She can't stand him. And suddenly my stomach turned and I thought, oh, my God, quick calculation in my head thinking, oh, my God, her daughter's about 15 months old. Oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And I said to him, are you sure the two year old's not around 18 months and not two years old? He said, oh, yeah, that's it. He didn't even care how old the child was, he didn't even care. And then as soon as he left that day to go and do a photo shoot, I start messaging this girl on Twitter privately and I say Ian's told me about your little gift for him because that's what he called it and she said oh cool what did he say and I start laying out to her everything that he had told me that she'd been doing to that child and um, I'm telling her what he had told me she'd done for him on camera and she didn't deny it she didn't respond like, oh, my God, what are you talking about? She didn't deny it. She didn't fully admit to it, but she did not deny it. And I said at one point, and I gave the police access to all my accounts, my email, my Twitter, my Facebook. I gave them access to everything, so all the messages were there for them to see. And I said to her, I just need to know, how much is he paying you? Because if you're doing this for money, don't do it because he's quite skint. He won't pay you. And I was just desperately trying to, to make her stop whatever she was doing because if she was doing it for money, there's no way in hell he was going to pay her. He was skint. He'd been skint for quite some time. And she replied with nothing and then a smiley face. Nothing and then a smiley face. And yeah. The, and, I, and, of course, the police had all this. The police had all and this. And email, the email that I sent to him, because then as soon as I'd got her to basically... Her her non-denial was her confirming everything, basically, and especially with her response of he's paying a nothing smiley face, that confirmed everything. So I then took to email to contact him and I'm bar barraging him like with emails, like bombarding him with a barrage of emails and I'm goading him in the end because that's what I would do with him. I would goad him to trip him up, to force him to explode and say something. And I said, I know who it is. This is, this is the woman's... 
whose child it is. I know this and I'm saying, how could you do this? Rape the fucking baby, I'm saying, and blah, 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 ranting in the emails. And, and he said, and he's trying to convince me it's not her. He said, it's not her. It's both parents involved. You're talking about somebody I barely know. And he's telling me that it's both parents involved. And then he said to me that, He's not he's not involved in that internet crowd because I'm saying to him you're meeting people on Twitter to to abuse the children and he's saying I'm not involved in that internet in, in that internet crowd I move in different circles and that as soon as he sent that email to me I thought bingo there you go now let's let, let's just because... go over that again so you're telling the guy you're caught bang to rights mate um, you know, all the informa- all the evidence is there against you. You're going to go down for this. You're done. And this guy, rather than panic, rather than try to go into self-preservation mode or do anything like that, he basically smugly hints at the fact that, well, he's got friends. Yeah. Yeah, because I... I operate in different circles or I move in different circles, he said. And the word circles just made me think ring paedophile ring and the and the way that he said it to me was like hinting that he's got people higher up that he's involved with and I just thought that's it that is why and all along for for a couple of years I'd had the gut feeling that he was involved in a paedophile ring and he even said on one of my visits to Doncaster police station when I took my laptop and show, showed them the image one of the images of the child, child that he'd sent me um I said to them, he's involved in a paedophile ring. And they said, well, how do you know that? I said, I just know. I have very good gut instincts. I I can predict things and I I know things. You know, when you just know something, you can't explain why you know it, but you know it. Well, you knew enough now. To be fair to you, your intuition, whether you call it woman's intuition or whether you call it a second, second sight or sixth sense, you knew plenty. And your gut had served you pretty well up to that point. I'm thinking now, Joanne, as I'm talking to you, this guy is smugly saying to you that uh, he moves in a different circle. I'm Mm. thinking, if we lived in a fair world, if we lived in an honest world, Watkins would have been offered some sort of plea deal, wouldn't he? Wouldn't he? I mean, if you think about it. And and listen, I've not watched too many uh, cop shows on the TV, CSI New York or any of that nonsense. That's what they do. They should have said to Watkins, listen... We spill the spill the beans, mate. Give us the whole story, and rather than thirty five years, we'll put you, we'll bang up for ten, and you'll be out in eight, and then we'll have a bracelet on you for the rest of your life. But we want to know, we want to know where else this goes. But they haven't done that with Watkins. No, at all. No, and <laughs> wow. even even after he was finally arrested. Do you, oh, do you know the only reason they went to his home and raided his home was on a drugs tip off, by the way. Every single report about him being a child abuser, a paedophile or having possession of child pornography, every single report was never acted on. But when someone made an anonymous tip off that he had drugs in his home and was importing drugs from America, they raided his home. And that is when they stumbled upon the evidence of child pornography. Stumbled. That's the only reason. It's hilarious to say stumbled. I'm not laughing at you, but stumbled. They had the evidence all along because you'd given it to him over a period mm-hmm. of four and a half years. They had the evidence. So what we're saying basically is, well, what I'm saying, because I'm not going to put words in your mouth, is that the police in Pontypridd and in Wales at large didn't investigate into uh, the allegations you were making against Watkins, even though you were giving them all manner of reason to do that uh, with the evidence you uh, had. I'm saying that what I'm taken from this is that they couldn't because like all those detectives that are coming out of the woodwork now that used to work at the Metropolitan Police in London and elsewhere and those detectives now are coming out and speaking to the Express and to Exaro News and they're saying we were stonewalled. When we got to a certain place we were told stop looking, stop investigating and you feel that in your gut Joanne do you? Um, yeah, because um, after he was, because what I what I also stumbled upon that same weekend that I discovered um, who the the child about the 
baby girl and who the mother was that same weekend i spent all that weekend from the 6th of october through to the 8th on the monday and that's when i spoke to child service on the monday because it took all weekend to actually get all the proof and because i thought i've been going to the police and they'd be saying where's your proof and i thought i've got it in black and white here that same weekend i discovered a private twitter account that i fully believe was ian's account because the this woman whose baby it was, she was tw- she kept tweeting this account. And on Ian Watkins' birthday, she kept tweeting. She was tweeting the account saying happy birthday. She was having conversations with the account. But I couldn't see that account's tweet because it was private. But I looked for all the tweets to that account. And there were images being sent by other Twitter users to that account of very young children or the Twitter users themselves holding up the child to the camera and taking a selfie and sending it to to this account that was Ian's account. I fully believe it was. And I thought, oh, bloody hell, he's got his own ring operating on Twitter now. He's got Twitter people sending images of, here's a child for you. So I gave all that to the police as well. And... I was talking to the police sometime later and I said, have you investigated that? Because I do believe he was involved in another ring as well. I said, I believe this was his own little private ring and I believe he was involved in another one. And the officer said to me, Joanne, you need to stop digging into this because you'll get yourself into trouble. An officer said to you, you need to stop digging into this because you'll get yourself into trouble. Yeah. Do you hear that, folks? 20 past nine on the 18th of November, 2015. We have a lady here, a lady who was harassed, bullied. And remember, when people are wrongfully accused of these things, they can self-harm. You know, Joanne could have went the other way and could have committed suicide. And I'm not saying that to be dramatic. I don't, I'm going to say it again. Jesus Christ, somebody accuses me of abusing children. You haven't done it. You know what people think about child abusers. You know how disgusting it is. How do you live with that? They harassed, they bullied, they followed this woman because she gave them a chain of evidence against Ian Watkins. Probably, and we can't prove this now, probably because Ian Watkins was a step on a chain that would have led to somebody else. And then they tell her, stop digging because you're going to get yourself into trouble. Holy Jesus. What did you say? I was too shocked at the time. And I said, what do you mean stop digging? I just said, what do you mean stop digging? Are you investigating it? I said, because I know for a fact that must be his account because why else would they be sending pictures of young children to it? Why else would they be holding a child up to the cameras if to say, here's one for you? (laughs) You know, And, and they just would end the phone call. And it's like... And and on another occasion that I called them and the same detective sergeant had said to me, "Um, we can't keep thanking you, Joanne. I said, I don't want thanks. I just wanted the police to do their bloody job. And it was like he was getting frustrated with my phone calls, checking up on how far, what they were doing with the investigation. And it was like he was getting frustrated. We can't keep thanking you, Joanne. I said, I don't want thanks. I just want you to do your bloody job. (laughs) I'm I'm stunned, Joanne. I'm stunned. I know the story because I obviously looked into it. Um, when you got in touch with um, with Aaron last week and when you guys were talking I've obviously looked into it and I've read it I've read all the reports and the BBC and the papers and everything and you just can't what I struggle with is that people who maybe don't hear programmes like this but have read those reports so they don't listen to the independent media but they've read The Guardian and The Mail is that they don't just get up in arms how can you read what happened to you what he was doing to those children and what he had said about, you know, having protection and moving in circles. How can people look at that and not realise that there is an enormous, uh, a powerful, uh, a sinister, a sickening paedophile ring in this country that's been operating for a long time and it goes up very high? How many more detectives need to come out and say, yeah, we were blocked 15, 20 years ago, we were told to piss off. We were told to stop, stop, go, stop or you'll be back to uh, walking to be uh, at, at four o'clock in the morning. That's what one guy said. You know, he was threatened with, um, mm. you know, humiliating duty. Keep asking questions, son, and you're back to four o'clock in the morning with the drunks, you know. Yeah, that, that, this yeah. is it, like, you know, this is mm-hmm. it. I'll I, I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to take, um, we're going to take uh, another very quick break. Um, we're going to keep Joanne on for another bit, folks. Um, we were going to do a phone in, but look, we'll, we'll postpone that till... Uh, to learning next week because there are other questions um, that we want to put to Joanne. Joanne's got very strong opinions about Theresa May, the Home Secretary. Uh, 
very important. So we're going to keep uh, Joanne with us for a while. You Are you good to do that? Have you got another 15, 20 minutes you can stay with us? Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. All right, so if Joanne's going to stay with us then, we will be back in three minutes' time. Don't go anywhere. This is, uh, well, it's more than important. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. NeonNettle.com, a new voice in alternative media. For unfiltered news at your fingertips, visit NeonNettle.com, the UK's number one alternative news site, in association with The Richie Allen Show. NeonNettle.com. Do you want to release the full potential of your soul consciousness and find out how to experience that power? in all areas of your life now. Go to livingasyoursoul.com for free guidance with in-depth how-to articles, free healing meditations of creation recordings, free soul solutions, and much, much more. Livingasyoursoul.com Making the profound practical. Broadcasting the information the mainstream media won't touch. This is The Richie Allen Show in association with DavidIke.com. And I'll tell you what, it is the information the mainstream media won't touch because Joanne did her interviews, of course, back in, in uh, earlier this year and she went on a couple of well-known television programmes. But they want John for five or six minutes. Oh, Joanne, it's terrible what happened to you and uh, Ian Watkins was a terrible man and yeah, blah, 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 blah. Thanks, Joanne. Piss off now. Have a drink in the green room and go home. That's the mainstream media. They don't want to talk about who Watkins might have been dealing with, who he might have been passing images to and videos, why the police were behaving like that. The mainstream media don't want to know that. We want to know that. We're the last bastion, the last line of defence. Jesus, I don't want to start sounding like Alex Jones, but we are a handful of us asking these questions in the independent media that are not being asked by the papers, not being asked by uh, uh, television programmes like This Morning or Sky News. You know, it's the serious stuff. Joanne, thanks for staying with us. So the Home Secretary then, for people who don't know, most people do know, is Theresa May. You quite rightly after your ordeal, wrote letters to her. Uh, Tell us what you wrote to her and tell us what her response was. Um, Well, back in 2013, um, I actually wrote to the Home Secretary and the Justice Minister and and a few others and about the police cover-up and I was begging her to make it, make changes in the law to make it a criminal offence for anyone, including police officers, to fail to act on reports of child abuse or to fail to report child abuse. Now that change supposedly happened in 2014, didn't it? In July, about July 2014. That's right, that's right, yeah, it's just over a year ago, yeah. When she, she ignored my emails though, she didn't even respond to my email. So I actually went to my local MP and I contacted also Ed Miliband because he was um, a Doncaster MP at the time as well, although he wasn't in my constituency. So I had to go to um, my local MP, who's actually brilliant. And I remember sitting with her and it was a month before I was actually arrested. And I remember sitting in her office and talking to her about it. And she actually contacted the IPCC chair um, Dayman hours. She contacted her on my behalf and said that I was worried that it was still going to be a cover up, and and she want and I wanted to make it a criminal offence. And they wrote back to me, and um, but so about a year later, these changes occurred, and I thought, oh, brilliant! This is everything that I've wanted. However, I'm not happy with Theresa May again. Because the recent um, investigatory powers bill that came out, it actually cites the Ian Watkins case in it. It's available to to download online. Anyone can look it up. And it actually cites it. And it's talking about the fact that if the police had these powers, they could have 
they could have done something sooner about Ian Watkins. They could have seized electronic equipment and everything. But the fact is, as proven in um, in the reporting to Bedfordshire Police, which has, was released in March this year, the other investigations into the different police forces are still ongoing. They're not due to finish till at least Christmas time, I've been told. Um, but Bedfordshire Police... Um, it actually proves in the IPCC investigation into them that they had all the evidence they needed from myself in order to seize electronic equipment from the female in Bedfordshire with the baby girl and Ian Watkins because I had given them access to my emails, to my Twitter, to everything. And they had seen the correspondence between myself and this mother where she's admitting to have contact with Ian Watkins and she's admitting to have spoken to him on Skype but when the officers went to her home she lied of course she lied through her bloody teeth she lied she said she'd never even spoke to Ian on Skype she'd never met him never anything but her messages in black and white contradicted that and the report states the IPCC have concluded that they should have seized electronic equipment so this um, investigatory powers bill that cites that case is bull basically she's there like praising she's saying operation globe was a south wales police investigation and that is one of my complaints against the police my latest complaint is the fact that every time i would call them to get an update and beg them to look into this look into that they would say that they can't discuss anything because it's an ongoing investigation now i've always thought for quite some time now that that investigation has closed they've stopped looking they've stopped looking into other people they've stopped looking for these children now why would Theresa may say it was an investigation by South Wales Police in past tense, if it was still ongoing. Well, don't as forget, well. we're talking about the woman who appointed Elizabeth Butler Sloss and Fiona Wolfe to head up the child sex yeah. abuse inquiry when she knew, Theresa May, that those women um, were compromised by their relationships with people uh, yeah. like Leon Britton, for example, who were suspected of child abuse. Mm -hmm. Now, in, again, I keep bringing this up on the programme. In any just and fair society, Theresa May would have had to resign in disgrace and humiliation for appointing those women. Not one, one is bad enough, but to do it a second time. Um, and she would have been disgraced forevermore in any, you know, seriously fair and, and uh, decent and just society. So that's who Theresa May is. I have, yeah. you know, some people in the independent media, they say terrible things. They don't have any proof of it. They say things about people. Um, I don't think for a minute that Theresa May uh, or George Osborne or David Cameron uh, have anything to do with um, abusing children. I don't believe that. I've never seen any evidence to suggest that. I don't believe it at all. What I do yeah. believe is, though, yeah. what I do believe, because I see the evidence of it every day, is that they are doing everything they can to keep a lid on it, even going as far as to strategically placing journalists in print media and in broadcast media who have uh, associations with politics going way back. Journalists who are now saying that the whole thing is a witch hunt and it's fantasy and all of that. Well, even though we learned the other day that files went missing about Edward Heath, uh, the former Prime Minister, and a child who went missing who was on his yacht and all of it is there. They're covering it up, Joanne. Uh, we we yeah, can't conclude yeah. anything else. And, uh, you know, it's heinous that Theresa May wouldn't, as the Home Secretary, email you back and go, Joanne, I'd love to have a cup of tea with you. I'm really sorry what happened to you. <laughs> You know, let, let me look into it. Let me make sure as a politician, as somebody in power, uh, the Home Secretary, let me make sure that nobody else again is put in the position you were put in for telling the truth. But you got ignored. And I've been in politics for years as a, as a reporter. I know damn well that Theresa May saw your email. I know she did. I know See, she this, did. The, the email that I sent was was a year before I was arrested. So it was before I was put through all that trial and everything. My email was just, my initial email was just basically begging her to change the law and make it a criminal offence. That was my initial email. And then I contacted her again in 2014 and I kept on and kept on and kept on. So... And the, num and, and the number of uh, tweeters, including Martin Houston, who's, um, you know, on child abuse as a, as a campaigner and has been for a long time, are pointing out and asking the question, is it a coincidence 
is that after uh, Joanne first contacted Theresa May that she gets arrested on a trumped up charge. There are certain coincidences you can't just believe in, Joanne, you know? Yeah, yeah, I know. And as, I, as I've just said to you, although the police have denied it, um, uh, my local MP is, is a, a lovely woman called Rosie Winterton. And I was contacting her about the cover-ups and everything. And she actually, um, when Theresa May made that speech last year, July last year, she actually sent me a copy of that that full um, Hanson, um, you know, where the parliamentary debate, she sent me a full copy of it, a full transcript of it. She said, this might, you might find this interesting. And at some point last year, my mail started going missing. And... Then I received an envelope in the mail addressed to my son and it was a big envelope and it had House of Commons stamped on it. And I thought, why is, why is Kyle getting met, met letters from the House of Commons? <laughs> and um, inside were his exam results and it was a, a compliment slip from Rosie saying this was delivered to our office by mistake. And she didn't realise at the time that Kyle was my son because we had different surnames. And I contacted Rosie and I said, oh, my God, I think the police have been stealing my mail and possibly stealing your mail and getting them mixed up and putting them back in the wrong mailboxes. That's probably why you got my son's exam results. The people so I charged, kind of com- the people charged with protecting people, the people that are supposed to be the front line in defending you, your person, your property, that are supposed to keep criminals, real criminals, locked up and away from people so they can't, uh, you know, do any harm. Those men and women who wear uniform are protecting people who are abusing children. If that's not bad enough, and it certainly is, they're persecuting people who are blowing the whistle on it, like you and others. I could mention Andrea Davison here, who is currently hiding out in South America, uh, because of what she discovered when she was investigating arms to Iraq many years ago. And now they're stealing people's mail. They're fitting people up. And when people like you go to Theresa May and complain about what ha- what, what, what what's happened, uh, you get a visit from the police and you're told you're charged with uh, mm. uh, being party to the whole thing. And then after you come out of, of the court case and it's, you're proven not guilty, of course, which you weren't, and you contact them again, they don't have the decency to even acknowledge that you exist and drop you an email. Folks, you can't believe, you cannot believe sometimes when you do programs like this that this is the world we're living in. It, it, it's, I tell you, I, I don't know how, I don't know what to say to you and I don't know what to say to people who, you know, because people listen to programs like this, they, they, they follow davidike.com, they follow uh, Jim Mars, Mike Rivero, and they constantly email David and Jim and they say, what, what can we do, what can we do, what can we do? People are helpless. How can you how can you do what's your answer Joanne what can people do listening to this tonight that how can they play their part to stop this that's a question now I don't know what you can do because I've done everything I've even contacted the independent child abuse inquiry I've even contacted them because uh, and I was stressing the point that even though I'm not an abuse victim I need to make the point clear. And as I've said to you all, all, all tonight, I need to make the point clear that it isn't just stuff that happened 30 years ago. It's still continuing and these police forces are still covering up and they need to be made accountable. Now, thankfully, I did read recently that the child abuse inquiry has changed and they've got more powers now. Previously, prior to July, uh, apparently they could not compel anyone to be accountable. However, they can now. Um, they can do that now, which is good because such as um, police officers who've retired because a number of police officers who were involved in this Ian Watkins cover up, a number of police officers have conveniently retired. Now, that means that if they retire, the IPCC can't even compel them to answer questions. They can't even compel them to come in for an interview because they're not part of the force anymore. And even the officers that were interviewed, such as like Bedfordshire police, they refused to answer questions. They just handed them a pre-written statement. So as if they predicted the questions that were going to be asked them. And they were they received a slap on the wrist and they were put straight back into the jobs where they failed to protect a 15 month old baby. And they left that baby with her mother for a further six weeks before she was finally arrested on the 21st of November 2012. Six weeks when they knew that she had been horrifically abusing that child and they're put back in the same job of protecting children and a slap on the wrist. And. 
that's, I don't know what people can do to what stop can it. You do? Non-violent, unless, non-violent civil disobedience, Joanne, is the only answer. It needs people to wake up and to refuse to participate in this system yeah. any longer. And you see, while we haven't got, because at the minute there is no authority that polices the police. That that's what we need. We need an authority with balls. An independent police actually, complaints commission. We don't really police. have one, yeah. Yeah. No, we don't. I protect corrupt coppers. That's what it is. We'll leave it for there. We'll leave it for now, right? Um we'll certainly be asking you back again in the future because you're not going anywhere and while you might no. sound while you might sound a bit um depressed not depressed or depressed is a terrible word but you, you, you sound you know uncertain or unsure of whether people can do anything about it um i know that you're still going to be asking questions and banging on doors and and that's something that um we'll um report when when you do it i can't you know begin to imagine what you went through joanne i really can't and you know you know one imagine. final quick thing that i'm going to say which you can talk to me about another time i actually can you know that original child the four-year-old child i actually eventually tracked down her father and contacted him and he also made a complaint to the police but the police and the family convinced him to drop it because it would ruin ian's ian's career that's what they said. It would ruin Ian's career. And you and I both know that the police couldn't give a shit about Ian Watkins' career. They couldn't give a damn. They couldn't give a damn about Bono's no. career. Uh, that is because somebody was leaning on them, in my opinion. Now, this is opinion, folks. Don't have the proof mm-hmm. of this. But it's my opinion that somebody was leaning on those constables and on that chief uh, police officer uh, in, in, in Pontypridd and elsewhere to stop it, to go away. Leave it's it alone. It's my very strong opinion. I'm going to say it's my very, very strong opinion too. Joanne, thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate no it. I think you've got guts. I think, I think you're one hell of a gutsy lady. I really do. Beyond anything I've ever uh, come across. Nobody will ever understand what you went through there being told to turn up to court and being accused of that. And I think you're amazing. And um, I, I do say this uh, sometimes, but when I do, I mean it. Um, the the, the programme is open to you any time you want to come back on it and talk to us and update us on anything. Is this uh, chat with Joanne, I, I hasten to say interview because it isn't, um, or I, I shouldn't say interview. Uh, the chat, our conversation will be online uh, to download as a podcast in around about 45 minutes time, but the repeats will begin at 11pm BST. Good luck to you, Joanne, and stay in touch. Thanks, Richie. You're very welcome. Absolutely amazing. That that was uh, Joanne Majelix on the line to us from uh, her home telling what is uh, an extraordinary but an absolutely 100% true story about what happened to her when she reported that a very well-known singer of a band was abusing children as young as two years of age. You couldn't make it up. 